Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. This episode of Car Crazy is one of a very special series of shows. I get asked all the time what my favorite episode of Car Crazy is, or who has been my best interview, or what is my favorite story. Well, they're all my favorites, but there are some that stand out. So we selected some of our best stories from our past guests and collected them in this very special series of Car Crazy episodes. Today's guests are four of the greatest racing heroes and champions of all time. They have solely and collectively inspired generations of motorsports enthusiasts. I've enjoyed their friendships through the years. I love their stories. So today's show, we'll revisit the golden age of motor racing with Carol Shelby, Parnelli Jones, Bob Bondurant, and Dan Gurney. Don't go away. McGuire's Car Crazy. We'll be right back. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy as we visit with some of the most famous race car drivers of all time. There is one name more than any other that intrigues the kid and all of us. Shelby. Carol Shelby. He not only has the rich history in auto racing as a driver, but his Shelby Cobras dominated the tracks of the world. They've inspired songs and the dreams of almost every little boy, and some big ones too. I sat down with Carol on Cobra Day right here at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles to talk about his passion for speed and beautiful cars. Carol, you're the bigger than life John Wayne personality of this hobby with enormous passion. Can we go back to the beginning and talk about the genesis of that passion? What was the start of it? My father was a rural mail carrier, but when I was three years old, I used to ride with him and I'd say, go faster, Daddy, let's go faster. And by the time I was five years old, every car that we met on the highway, I could tell you what it was, whether it was a 28 Chevy, whether it was a uh, 28 Model A, or whether it was a Durant, or whether it was a Moon, or whatever it was, I could tell you what it was. And I've always loved cars. I've never lost that passion. Cars and airplanes. And then as you began to grow up, what was the first car that you had attachment for? In Texas, you could get a driver's license when you were 14 years old. And my dad had a uh, 34 model Dodge. And he took me down the day after my 14th birthday and got my driver's license. And the next day, I asked him if I could drive the car. I'd already been driving uh, with him with me. And I asked him if I could take the car out and drive it. He said, sure, son, it's your 14th birthday. I got stopped by the cops and brought home for doing 85 miles an hour. So I didn't drive for a while. My father saw to that. <laughs> Well, you obviously always had speed in your blood. What was your true first racing experience? Well, my first racing experience was with jalopies and motorcycles. Back before uh, the war, I went into the Air Force then when I was 18 years, barely 18 years old. And uh, six months later, I was in flying training. But as soon as I got out, I got right back into uh, automobiles. 1947, I started trying to build my own car with my friend Ed Wilkins from Dallas and uh, got run out of the house because uh, we were making too much noise at night, trying to bang the fenders around. We were trying to put a Hemi in a chassis that Ed had built. One morning I said, all I've ever wanted to do is drive race cars, so why don't I just do it? Let's see if I can make a living. Three years later, I was driving for a factory team in Europe. 
Uh, but all during that time, I still wanted to build my own car. And as interested as I was in driving race cars, the main thing that I wanted to do was see how the little European companies, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Maserati, how they built their cars and how they operated. Well, as a race driver, you were king of the hill in 1959. What was going on inside Carroll Shelby? The biggest thing that went on inside of Carroll Shelby is that last five laps at Le Mans. I heard more transmission problems. I heard the engine <laughs> going away on me that last five laps. And finally, I just practically prayed that nothing was happening, that it was all my ears and my imagination. And uh, we won that race. And it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me in racing, probably outside of uh, winning the championship as a driver uh, with Aston Martin and then building my own cars that won the world championship. Yes. That was a big thrill too, Barry. That, what's the best thing about the car hobby? Can you, can you capture one thing or a couple of things you think that's the, the, what you enjoy most about the car hobby? I enjoy the, the car hobby mostly, Barry, because of the people that are in it. The, the people, the, as you just mentioned, the passion and seeing the passion that these people have for their cars, this, this is terribly important to them. This is a very important part of their life. And when you see all of the pressures that society puts on families today and people, for them to have something like this that can take some of that pressure off, mm -hmm. I think that it's just fabulous. I think that it really helps a lot of people survive in this uh, society that we live in today. Stay tuned. Car Crazy looks back and more great interviews with some of the fastest men to ever hit a racetrack right after this. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Most people remember their first driving experience, but for a race car driver, remembering the first time they went fast is a memory they could hold on to for a lifetime. Pernelli Jones knew he had a natural talent, but he also knew it took something a little more to become a champion. Let's go to the beginnings of your first attachment to thinking that you'd like to go fast in a car. When I, when I turned 16, I got this old hot rod, and uh, there was a kind of a quarter of a mile dirt track, and it was kind of grown over and had grass on it and everything else. And for some reason or other, we started hot lapping this uh, quarter mile track there and sliding the car and everything. And later I used to work in a, in a garage, so I used to wash parts and stuff like that. And then my cousin took his wife's old 34 Ford and made a uh, jalopy out of it. And then he used to let me warm this thing up a little bit and with all that open exhaust and everything, I mean, I just took the hook, you know, so. Was there a first time when you were behind the wheel and it, it, it started occurring to you that, hey, I. I really have some natural ability to do this. I could, I could be good at this. Believe it or not, I never, after wrecking my car week after week after week, I had all this desire, but I didn't have the natural talent. I didn't have it. I had this desire. And once I was able to conquer my desire a lot, then the talent came. The first time you went to Indy, it was, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. It was very exciting for me. I mean... That was my desire, uh, uh, you know, to go to Indianapolis was one thing, but I also had a desire to win. And I was fortunate to lead the race the first year uh, for 27 laps. But you ended up Rookie of the Year. Yes, yeah. But uh, I, I thought, man, if I could just ever win this race, it would be it. And then winning in 1963, two years later. What was that like? Was, can, you, can you go back the emotions you had when you crossed that line you knew you'd won? It didn't sink in as much then as it did... Uh, Later that night, uh, I went, I probably didn't get to bed till two or three o'clock in the morning, but anyway, I probably slept for an hour and I woke up and I ran into the bathroom and I slapped myself in the face and looked in the mirror to make sure I wasn't dreaming. You really did that? It was that thrilling for me. In addition to our interviews, we love to show you the fabulous collections that some of our guests have acquired. And Parnelli Jones has some great treasures in his garage. We have the Johnny Lightning cars. Didn't they win Indy in 70 and 71? That's right. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the, my, probably my favorite car in this collection. It's uh, uh, our first car as a car owner winning Indianapolis in 1970. And uh, we sat on the pole with a new track record, uh, led 191 of the 200 laps. And uh, it didn't have one drop of oil coming out of it anywhere. I mean, I think you could have lined it up and run another 
200 laps. I mean, that it was that nice. Yeah. And a lot of people forget that your off-roading career was as prolific as your Indy career. Well, actually, yeah, I've had a lot of fun in this car. I've won the Baja 1000 twice, once in 71, 72, and uh, set a record down there in, in 14 hours and 59 minutes. And of course, here's the Roadster that you actually won Indy with as a driver. Well, actually, it's not the one, but it's a replica. It's an identical replica uh, of the car that I won. The car is uh, in the museum at uh, Indianapolis. Lots of memories there? Lots of memories. Brings back a lot of memories, I'll tell you that, yeah. I drove uh, in 1961, 2, 3, and 64, so four years. And, uh, Spent a lot of time in that First car to run 150. Yeah. Uh, Should have won the race in 62. I was leading the race long gone. Came back in 63 and won. Was leading the race in 64 when it caught on fire in the pits. And that kind of ended the career for this particular car. Mm -hmm. Of course, the rear engine cars were really the cars to beat at that yeah, time. And the so. whole changeover came. Right. You know, standing here in front of this car, can you give us just a little more insight into what it was like during that race when you won the Indy 500? You know, pulling into victory lane, I mean, it just, it's unbelievable. It's just a great thrill with all those people there. And, uh, and having the traditional drink of milk. And the traditional drink of milk. After this break, McGuire's Car Crazy will bring you Bob Bondra. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Earlier in today's show, we sat down with Carol Shelby, who created a racing dynasty. Now we meet with one of the men who raced for him. Bob Bondra tells about racing for Shelby and driving with Dan Gurney as a teammate. So, Bob, how far back can you trace your passion for cars? I remember my dad took me to uh, Gilmore Stadium when I was eight years old and uh, watching the midget races. And yeah. Pee Wee DeStarcy, uh, Parnelli Jones were racing them. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, you know, this would be fun. I guess the first, really, first race I ever did was a drag race at a uh, 46 Ford convertible with the Santa Ana drag strip. So you were on your way. Yeah, that's so, all good. So then how did your involvement with Corvette start? I ran into my, my ex-mechanic, Don Bechtel, and Don Bechtel said, uh, I'll work for you for free for every race you win. I mean, that's inspiration. Right, great. For a guy who doesn't have any yeah, money, I thought, like, well, I'll try it. And uh, <laughs> for Don, I won 18 <laughs> out of 20 races. Yeah, I got an offer from, uh, from uh, Shelley Washburn, said that uh, Chevrolet was building four racing Corvettes, the, the Stingray, the first Stingray that came out. And so I said, yes, I'll come back and do that. That race at Riverside, uh, Billy Krause drove, drove the Cobra against our Corvettes and blew us all off, but he broke a half shaft, so he didn't finish, but the handwriting was but on the wall. <laughs> I was the only uh, Stingray that could stay with the Cobras, but I could not beat him. I got a call out there from Carol. Yeah, I bet. And he said, <laughs> uh, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, what are you doing such and such a week? And I said, nothing. He said, uh, great. You're driving Ken Miles Cobra. Just like that? Just like that. So this incredible partnership and friendship that you developed with Carol and enjoyed to this day. I mean, you're oh, such yeah. a great friend, but that is how it all began. I never heard that story. Yeah, that's how it all began. And uh, I won the race. Davey uh, McDonald was driving the other uh, Cobra. And I uh, went to the, the uh, Le Mans 24 hour race. And I was fortunate I was teamed with uh, Dan Gurney. And uh, he had run uh, Le Mans several times, never finished. I said, Dan, do me a big favor. I'll run as quick as I can run smooth. You run as slow as you can run smooth. And I think we have a chance of winning the GT category. He said, I can't guarantee you I'll try, but I, I can't guarantee you if I can run slow enough to do it. So we won the GT category, and we beat Ferrari by about four laps. Well, what was it like driving with this great team for Carroll Shelby and winning the World Manufacturers Championship? It was wonderful. And when you win over there, you get up from the, uh, the podium, put the wreath around your neck, do the champagne, play the national anthem of the country the driver's from, and every time I heard the good old national anthem, it made you so proud to be an American Beating the Europeans, and at that time beating the very best yeah. in, in Europe with, yeah. with Ferrari. I mean, it was racing history. Oh, yeah, it, it was fantastic. After a string of victories in Europe for Team Shelby, Bob Bondra was <coughs> invited to take a meeting with the old man himself, Enzo Ferrari. So 
Surti he's told me, he said, you must go down and see the old man. He wants to see it. Walk in, there's this enormous desk, six floodlights shining down on the desk. Surti's is sitting on one side, the old man, and then the Ferrari's right hand man. So I sat down, and the interview was uh, what I like to drive for a Ferrari and what I like to live in Italy. And I said, well, I would like to, uh, I'd like to live in Italy. Uh, I'd like to drive Formula One, Formula Uno. Possible Formula Uno Bandarati, would you like to drive prototypo? Prototypes. So in the end, I signed on, drove for, um, for Ferrari. And so what happened? 66. Well, I got a call back from uh, the old man and uh, said, you must come back to the factory and we're going to fit you out for a Formula One car before Prototipo. And that was the end of 65. We just beat him. So he gave me a ride for the U.S. Grand Prix in 65. Dino powered, sort of a V12 as a V6. But to be able to drive a for your first Formula One race was your in dream. your own country was your dream. for a Ferrari, that was my dream. Don't touch that remote. Right after this break, we'll bring you the legend himself, Dan Gurney. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. As a driver, Dan Gurney stands out. He has won seven Formula One races, including four World Championship Grand Prix, five NASCAR stock car races, seven IndyCar races, and the four sports car endurance classics. You can bet he had a lot to share with us, but it had to start somewhere, like his first ride in a go-kart. When did your interest in cars, this peculiar interest in cars that you have, first begin? When was the first spark, do you think? Early on, when I was nine years old, my folks bought me a, an Irish male. You remember the things that used to, uh, four-wheelers and, uh, you know, a go-kart without a motor, yeah. but you could pump it. And it had, this one particular one had a steering wheel, and it had uh, little uh, uh, balloon tires. and. There was a, a sidewalk down there, and, and after a rain uh, near our house, why there would be a, a really neat <laughs> mud puddle down there, and you could go through there and get her sideways and cross up. And that, to me, I don't know, that got me going. I felt like I was getting through there pretty well. One of Dan Gurney's most poignant moments was receiving a posthumous compliment from one of his heroes. He had a great uh, uh, competition between you and Jimmy Clark. I know uh, you had so many great races together, and and when we lost him uh, at the funeral, his dad gave you a wonderful compliment. Yes, um, that was uh, um, I was maybe uh, undoubtedly the best compliment of my driving career. Uh, didn't want to get it that way. Uh, he, um, when I introduced myself, he was meeting the guests at this wake, and um, he. Uh, I said, hello, Mr. Clark, uh, I'm Dan Gurney. And he said, oh, oh uh, Dan, c come in here to this other room, and uh, I want to tell you something. And uh, he said, uh, you know, Jimmy said you were the only one that he ever feared in a race car. And I said, Mr. Clark, uh, Jimmy never feared anyone. And uh, he said, well, yes, he did, because he told me that many times. So um, <clears throat> it's pretty hard for me to talk about yeah. it, <laughs> even today. Needless to say, Dan Gurney's most memorable moments took place on the track. Some of them were humorous, some victorious. That's a funny story. Here you had been to Europe before, but always with Phil Hill or some other people looking in after you. But now you're 20 years old. You really didn't know that much about Europe, and you're going for an audition at Ferrari. Here are these engineers in Enzo Ferrari with their overcoats and the fedoras, the black and... Uh, the, the hats and the overcoats, and uh, these are mysterious looking oh, guys. You know, talk and, about intimidation. Yes, I had asked some advice from the guys in the Albergo Reale, was the hotel that we're staying in. Uh, you know, what should you do under these circumstances? And they said, well, drive as fast as you can, but don't make any mistakes. <laughs> well, you know, thanks easy. a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so I. Progressed from the two-liter sports car to the three-liter, which was like they were running at Le Mans, and then got in this Formula One car and uh, drove around there. And uh, I didn't know if I did well or not. Two days later, they asked me to be ready at six in the morning. We're going to drive up to Monza. It was about a two-hour drive, and it was raining cats and dogs the whole way. 
I had a fairly good sized wad of these 10,000 lira notes. And I didn't want to leave them in the pit, so I uh, put them in my driving suit. And what happened was, when I got in this seat, I, I noticed within about a lap and a half, my throttle foot would start to go to sleep. It would get pins and needles in it and to where it didn't have any, any feel whatsoever. <laughs> this is not good. And, and I had no idea what was causing it. I, I, was, I was dumbfounded. And it wasn't until uh, a couple of weeks later that I realized that it was this wad of 10,000 lira notes that was pressing in just the right way in my, the nerve just my right. whole it, foot would go to sleep. So here it is, it's raining, you're running about 160 miles an hour and, you're and your throttle asleep. foot is asleep. Oh. What a situation, and you can't see anyway, you know? It was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty good. But uh, let's don't overlook that. You won Le Mans with A.J. Oh, yes. Uh, and A.J. hadn't done much road racing. He did a great job over there. I hadn't won it either, and I had tried probably eight different, nine, maybe 10 times, uh, starting in 58. When I got together with A.J., we were voted the least likely to succeed. We, they knew we were going to wreck the car or something, trying to beat each other. And I always thought, well, it's a race, isn't it? So you just gas it. Well, the car would lay down. And, uh, but eventually, I realized that, well, no, it's an endurance contest, not a race. And uh, I don't think A.J. trusted me at first. But I never ran that car really hard all through practice or qualifying. and. Uh, Sure enough, when the race started, we were leading within the first hour. That was amazing. And of course, it just sailed through, never had a bit of trouble during the whole race. And we ended up uh, bumping the record up by more than 10 miles per hour. It's our privilege to share with you the wisdom and insights of some of the most fascinating people in the car hobby. Today's guests are not only my friends, they're my heroes. A big thank you to our guests for opening their hearts up to us. And to you, our viewers, thanks for being Car Crazy. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.